Hello and welcome to this presentation on educational technology planning. My name is Rob Power. I'm an adjunct professor of educational technology and a member of the executive of the International Association for Mobile Learning. In this presentation, we're going to explore a step-by-step -step process for effective educational technology planning, including defining and specifying everything about your context that could and should influence any technology integration decisions, mapping different technologies against their teaching and learning benefits, factors to consider to ensure we maximize learner engagement when using educational technology, formally analyzing how well different technologies fit with our teaching and learning needs and contexts, making a formal documented case for selecting and integrating specific technologies, staying flexible and adaptable during the actual implementation of technology integration, and additional bigger picture considerations that we should keep in mind because they could influence our initial technology integration plans or long-term implementation prospects. Enhancing teaching and learning with technology can be a daunting prospect, but it need not be. Many educators have a lot of questions about where to start with the process, let alone how to sustain momentum. One of the biggest mistakes made by teachers and institutions is to begin their where to start process with a focus on which technologies to adopt. There are so many technology trends, so many next great things that it can be overwhelming to pick which ones to focus on. Not only is this approach overwhelming, it's the wrong approach. Decisions about which technologies to integrate should not begin with the technologies themselves. That places the emphasis on how do we fit these technologies in. Instead, we should begin with our own context and then start looking at what needs to be enhanced before examining the best technology tools to do the job. The best place to start with defining our context is the syllabus or the course outline. The syllabus is our contract with our students. It defines the course and lists our overarching goals. By starting with the syllabus, we can better justify any technology planning decisions that we make. Start with the syllabus and ask what you want your students to learn. Then ask yourself what you could do to be more effective in facilitating that learning. For example, in this sample syllabus from one of my courses, I can start from a specific learning objective such as you should be able to apply best practices in choosing appropriate learning technologies to optimize student engagement. Then ask yourself how you could be more effective in facilitating that learning. But our learning context does not just include learning objectives and proposed activities. The syllabus provides contextual information about not only the course itself, but also the program in which the course resides the school, the institution, or the organization. Some of that information includes the demographic makeup of our target learners and the faculty who lead the course. It's important to ask if the course, program, or organization have any special requirements that could influence your technology choices. Do they create any particular constraints on the range of tools that you could consider? Or do they create any unique opportunities for technology use? Now that I've focused on a specific learning objective and to find the context in which the teaching and learning will take place, I can return to my learning objective and ask what type of learning activity I'd like to use to help my students achieve that goal. In this case, I asked my students to create a group presentation about future trends in educational technology. Once I knew the objective, the context, and the proposed activity, then I could start listing potential technology tools to support that learning. For instance, this proposed activity could leverage online collaborative planning tools to help group members organize and track their work, video conferencing tools to help group members meet in real time to work on their projects, video production tools to help them create their presentation content, and podcasting tools or tools such as YouTube to host and broadcast their final presentations. Not all tools are created equal. Some technologies have different properties and are better suited for some pedagogical purposes than others. So it's important to have an understanding of how different technologies map out against our teaching and learning needs. One of my favorite starting points in the educational technology planning process is Tony Bates's free ebook, Teaching in a Digital Age. 
In Chapter 7, Bates discusses the pedagogical differences between different media formats. Understanding these differences will help us to first choose which type of media we want to explore before we start looking at specific tools, applications, or software suites. The University of New South Wales in Australia has a great website that maps learning outcomes to activities and potential tools. This site also has a link to resources that will help you select appropriate assessment technologies. And if you want to look at how mobile apps could map out against learning objectives and pedagogical affordances, take a look at Alan Carrington's ever-expanding pedagogy wheel. It's not enough to just match educational technology to pedagogical affordances. By starting with our outcomes and learners, we have a better understanding of our learners' unique needs. We need to ensure that our tools contribute to the learning process rather than make it more difficult. To that end, we need to maximize our learners' engagement when using the technologies we choose. There are three key areas we should try to maximize engagement. Presence, distance, and accessibility. Garrison, Anderson, and Archer's Community of Inquiry model outlines the areas of presence that contribute to maximize learner engagement. These are social presence, cognitive presence, and teacher presence. Social presence is the level of engagement between learners. Cognitive presence is the level of engagement with the learning content and how well this is facilitated through the articulation of goals and direction provided to the learner. Teacher presence is the level of engagement with the teacher in an instructional role. So when choosing what technologies we want to integrate and how we plan to use them, we should carefully consider how those tool choices will impact each of these presences. The idea is to use technology to increase the presences, thereby increasing overall engagement with the tools and the learning itself. Moore's transactional distance theory is similar to the community of inquiry model in that it talks about learners engagement with other learners, content and the instructor. Transitional distance theory tells us that in any learning context, there are gaps or distances that impact engagement and effective learning. When selecting technologies to facilitate teaching and learning, the idea is to keep in mind how those technologies will affect those distances. Will the use of the technology increase the distances between the learner and other learners, the content or the instructor? Or will they effectively bring the learner closer to their peers, content and instructor? By defining our context, including our learner demographics, early in the educational technology planning process, we gain an appreciation of any unique needs that our learners may have. This often includes disabilities that may affect learners' ability to engage with either their peers, the learning content, the instructor, or the technology tools themselves. When we know this, we can make technology decisions that accommodate those unique needs. But maximizing the accessibility of our learning, including the tools used to facilitate that learning, goes beyond just helping specific students with identified needs. Addressing the overall accessibility of tools and content makes for a better learning experience for all potential students. Many jurisdictions have begun mandating technology accessibility standards, and in most cases those standards reflect the accessibility guidelines published by the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C. It's a good idea to become familiar with these standards and the resources that the W3C has available to help maximize accessibility. Accessibility is such a central issue in the educational technology sphere that the Quality Matters Organization, which offers training and quality assurance accreditation for online learning, has included accessibility and usability as one of the primary domains in its course evaluation rubric. We've started with our context and our teaching and learning needs. We've mapped out potential technologies to the pedagogical affordances. And we've considered presence, distance, and accessibility, and how our potential tools could address these to maximize learner engagement. Now it's time to take a more formal look at how well our potential tools fit with our needs. While there are many different rubrics floating around, one of my favorite tools is Bates's Sections. Sections stands for Students, Ease of Use, Cost, teaching and learning, interactivity, organizational issues, novelty, and speed. 
As you can see, we've already started looking at a number of these components. Underhill put together an evaluation checklist based on Bates' sections that's broken down in four stages. For now, we'll focus on the first two, define and analyze. We've already answered the four questions from the define stage of Underhill sections tool. I really want students to learn. I think I could be more effective at facilitating this learning if. The learning activity that I've chosen to address these objectives is and the technology that I'm thinking of using to support this learning is. So at this stage, we just need to insert our responses to these questions. In the Analyze stage, Underhill presents a series of 27 questions related to eight sections components. The checklist worksheet includes check boxes for yes, no, or not applicable for each question, as well as columns to indicate how important those specific considerations are in our context, and any special considerations that we should keep in mind. The sections checklist is designed to be completed for each technology you're analyzing. Oftentimes, we're looking at more than one potential technology to meet our needs. I found that creating a spreadsheet version of the checklist can be quite helpful because it makes it possible to easily compare multiple tools side by side. Another tool that I've been working on is CSAM, or the Collaborative Situated Active Mobile Learning Design Framework. CSAM can be used like sections and is a good complement to sections when analyzing how well mobile technologies and mobile learning resources will fit with our needs and context. Now that you've formally analyzed potential educational technology tools from the perspective of your own teaching and learning needs and context, it's time to piece everything together to make your case. It's important to do this whether you're integrating technology on a small scale in your own classroom or as part of a formal instructional design process. Formally documenting your decisions and rationale helps others to see the justification for your technology choices. It also makes it easier to change course when the need arises. Making your case could be as simple as documenting your decisions as part of a daily lesson plan. Or it could be more formal, such as preparing a briefing note or funding proposal for other stakeholders and decision makers. As part of a lesson plan, the steps you've carried out so far in the planning process will help you to fill in your learning objectives, planned activities, and required resources. As part of a more formal document, such as a briefing note, the steps you've carried out so far will help you to provide the contextual information, needs assessment, and propose solutions and rationale that other stakeholders will be looking for in order to support your proposal. Even with well-laid plans, things do not always go smoothly when using technology for teaching and learning. But don't worry, you've got this. If you know what you want to achieve and you've evaluated your technology options, it's easier to remain flexible. It's important to be ready to adapt, sometimes on the fly. For instance, if your email server is down, have a listserv service like Google Groups ready as a backup. If Skype's acting up during a video conference, switch to Google Hangouts. If YouTube doesn't work for your students, try something like Vimeo instead. You get the idea. Always have a backup plan. And it's easier to have a backup plan when you've already analyzed alternative tools. Despite your best laid plans, there are always other considerations and bigger picture issues that could affect your proposed educational technology integrations. Not the least of which is the likelihood that your target users will actually adopt the proposed tools. The technology acceptance model tells us that our intentions to use technology tools are shaped by our perceptions of how useful the tool is and how easy it is to actually use that tool. So if you're having a hard time achieving uptake of a new tool, you may need to consider how your learners or other faculty perceive those technologies and what external influences are creating those perceptions. In a two-part blog post, Zuniga also points to another of other forgotten considerations that could impact educational technology integration, including budgeting and investment in educational technology resources, the importance of basing investment decisions on curriculum-based needs, the ongoing organizational need to track educational technology resources, and the inevitable need for ongoing technology maintenance and replacement.